Yeah, I think this is a, an important uh, discussion because I think one of the biggest fears we have with MPNs is is this uh, p- the potential for progression. Now, now not a, not everyone experiences progressive disease, and you know, progression to one person may mean something different to someone else. Um, but largely, we're talking about changes from ET to PV, PV to MF, and then you know, any of these can can convert over to to acute leukemia, which is it raises concern. And the, the progressions are different, you know, from one one of these diseases to another. When we think about progression from the chronic phase, such as ET or PV, maybe to myelofibrosis, that seems like a, a somewhat of a more natural progression that can occur over or decades, um, but it's different for every patient. And this could be just an accumulation of the inflammation that's, that develops with the ongoing disease. And you know, in, in, in our discussion of these things, we you kind of talk uh, maybe biologically what drives progression in the sense that that there are there is good evidence that inflammation, you know, which is a kind of a general term, does play a role. We know that patients that uh, smoke, that have certain genetic susceptibilities, are more likely to develop NPNs, and and even in some cases more likely to develop myelofibrosis from the chronic phase of NPNs. But in terms of um, in terms of risk factors, I think that that's been you know somewhat hard to pin down. I think people have associated maybe Jack two mutant allele burdens with with progression, um, uh, certain driver mutations, but it changes depending on the study, which one of those can be associated with progression. Recently, um, there was a study looking at different molecular abnormalities in the chronic phase. And um, this this seemed to suggest that, you know, in the setting of ET, maybe some splicing mutations in SF3B1, U2AF1, uh, may be associated with an increased risk of progression. Um, and it may differ between ET and PV as well. Um, so, you know, largely we're thinking about kind of a chronic inflammatory burden, maybe some higher intensity or burden of disease, and maybe these additional mutations that, um, contribute to the progression from chronic phase to, to myelofibrosis. Uh, when we think about leukemic transformation, you know, this may be a little bit different. Um, you know, this is something that occurs more rarely, maybe something we're on the order of five to 10% over the course of 20 years and from, uh, either chronic phase or from myelofibrosis. Um, and for, um, you know, for, for these risk factors, I think it, it largely comes down to the genetics of the disease in many cases. Um, we know that patients that have abnormal, uh, cytogenetics, certain chromosomal abnormalities, as well as what we consider to be high risk mutations can, can really influence this. So I think the key ones are when we think about things on the P53 axis. So P53 mutations, very rare in the chronic phase, very, um, quite common actually in, in the leukemic phase. And so this could be associated with an increased risk of progression. Additionally, we see things like uh, MDM4 or MDM2 overexpression. These are key regulators of the P53 uh, pathway, and these can be associated with progressive disease phenotype. Um, but additionally, mutations in things like IDH2, SRSF2 um, uh, can be you know, looked at as risk factors for the disease to, to act more unstably and, and in a more volatile fashion and have an increased risk of leukemic progression. Um, that's kind of the underlying genetics. I think when we look at the, you know, the clinical factors and features, you know, sometimes we can identify things like you know, maybe thrombocytopenia or increased circulating blast. These would also be kind of easier risk factors for disease progression. To, to AML as well.